Hey there, listener. Welcome to the Deep Share Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Rouse, and for the last couple of decades, I've slowly been opening my eyes to a very different world than the one I grew up hearing about. And the more conversations I have with interesting people, the more mystifying this world becomes. So without further ado, let's get deep. We've got science to celebrate! Demons bliss out! Off your butt, Fippy! Come on! There is a rebellion in the wind. It will be crushed. Everything I've said is true, it's real. Dinosaur fossils? I'd like to put those here to test our faith. That damn lie, I, I saw them on my own eye! Did I the cues just drop sharply while I was away? We did it illusions, man! None of it is true! I'm not insane! This is mass madness, you maniac! In God's name, you people are the real thing! We are the illusion! Welcome back to the Deep Share Podcast, everybody. Um, so, as you know, I've been kind of sticking my head deep into ancient history for a long time, and I love the concept of of the feud between the human family. And man, when I hear this guy's work, it kind of opens the floodgates on these topics, and I can't wait to have this conversation. So, everybody, please welcome Ian Ferguson, the White Lotus of Light. How's it going, man? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, it's going great, man. Like, honestly, I can say, and I'll knock on wood while saying this, I am a bit superstitious, uh, touch wood, but um, my life has actually never been better than it is like right now. I mean, it's it's so, so good on so many levels. So many things have just really opened up to me. And it's, um, you know, uh, among the many things I do, I'm a practicing angelic magician. And so I commune with and work with the angels all the time. And that has uh, completely transformed my life. And like, uh, a way I almost can't possibly overstate, like how 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 much my life has improved since I've really dived deeply into that celestial current. So I'm That's doing awesome. incredibly well. How about you, man? That's so great to hear, man. I'm doing really well too. Um, I I actually was just having a conversation with my wife before the show, saying that I feel like I finally reached a place with podcasting where mm-hmm. I have this equilibrium. It's not taking over other parts of my life. I'm not neglecting it. It's just this nice wave and I'm starting to have some sort of consistency with my releases and things like that. So yeah, I'm actually feeling really good about things. And I keep this mantra going, which is kind of my method of, of, I don't know, quote unquote manifestation, where I just have this very vague mantra that I cut, that I Mm -hmm. say often. And right now it's, Oh, a lot of negativity is reversing right now. Interesting. And I just leave and then I just let it go and I go about my day. And that's been really working lately. A lot of things that I've been dwelling on or things that uh, have been kind of forcing us to just sludge through life lately on certain levels, things are just starting to get better. And it all it took was like one or two of those. And then that Mm -hmm. mantra came to me and then boom, it starts to flow a little bit better from there. So, yeah, man. I guess we're both doing pretty damn well. And that's a great way to start this conversation. (laughs) Yeah, Thank you so much for having me on, by the way. So, yeah. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks for having, for being on here, man. Uh, I heard you twice on tinfoil hat. And as Mm -hmm. I told you before the show that when I saw your name pop up uh, on this, this new appearance, I was like, Oh my God, that's right. I never reached out to him. (laughs) I told Ian before the show here that I admitted <laughs> that at work, I literally halted everything I was doing. I got off my fork truck and just started taking notes as Ian was just dispelling all this crazy information because you, especially your Malachian versus Luciferian concept is amazing. I just eat it up because not that I've ever used that particular duality before but it (laughs) so works with everything else it's very fractal in a way and i like the way you describe it and i know that a lot of people have probably heard it from some other appearances but for those who have it please could you give us a little first let's actually do some background here who the hell are you ian and where did you come from (laughs) and how did you get into this line of thinking and this line of work yeah man wow um it's it, it it's been a, a, a what a long strange trip it's been i think grateful dad said that or something like that right. it, uh, it's been it's been very odd brother like this whole uh journey i mean when i was young i had lots of like sort of psychic and mystical experiences and then the hormones hit 
And uh, at, when the hormones hit, like I just completely seemingly forgot that there was a spiritual aspect to the world at all. I was just thinking about the ladies and that was it. And uh, yeah, then uh, in my 20s, I, uh, I went to school kind of late. I like worked and traveled a bit before going to college. And I was taking a uh, Religions of India class in 2000 and we read the Bhagavad Gita and there was a passage in it that, um, you know, there's different translations on it, but it goes something roughly like, basically it's uh, where Arjuna and, and and Shiva are talking and Arjuna and they're on the battlefield in the Bhagavad Gita. And like all of a sudden Arjuna realizes that his chariot driver is not just a chariot driver. It's actually Shiva in disguise. And Shiva's like, I'm the Nataraja. And like, you know, he trips out and realizes he's talking to this godly being. And um, it's right as he's in the middle of charging on his chariot towards his cousin in this huge, like, internecine, like, civil war that's going on in, in ancient Vedic India. And so they have this whole conversation with the backdrop of a battlefield that's, like, frozen in time. Pretty epic <laughs> backdrop. And so Arjuna says, I don't want to kill my cousin. You know, like, I'm really torn up inside that I'm about to, like, that's my cousin right across the field. Like, I may very well end up having to kill him here. I don't want to do that. I'm so torn. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. You can't kill your cousin. He's like, uh, well, we're, we're, we're here to kill each other. Like, what are you talking about? And he says, oh, no, that's basically like a change of clothes. And he's like, what do you mean? And he said, well, your, your cousin is not his body. He's the Atman. And for the Atman fire cannot burn it water cannot drown it air cannot wither it sword cannot cut it for the atman is eternal immortal and changeless and it felt like when i read that passage and i'm paraphrasing slightly but when i read that passage it felt like i was inside of a gigantic like church bell and someone hit it with a mallet because it was like boom I know there was this feeling. like intense resonance <laughs> to where i was just like what and i was like what is even happening and I felt something shift in me in a significant way, and I didn't really know what it was. And then a few months later, that same term, uh, I smoked a bunch of weed after having not slept and not eaten much food. And I just got done with the term. And the first thing I wanted to do was smoke some bowls, right? You know, I was in my 20s and I was like, yeah, free at last, we're done with the quarter, let's smoke some fatties. And I and I really went for it too. And I hadn't smoked for like a couple of weeks because it's finals. And um I got just mega, mega faded. And I couldn't even I was trying to play Mario Kart with my guys and and I was just like smashing at the wall and they kept hitting me with turtle shells. And I was like, oh, okay, like I can't even play. And then I was like laying on the couch and I was like, guys, I can't even watch you guys play. I'm like tripping. I gotta go lay down. And I went to my bedroom, I laid down, and I had this whole elaborate vision. <clears throat> but a big part of it was I basically saw 9-11 happen, uh, not like planes flying into buildings, but I saw this massive impact on a map, like from space, exactly where New York is on the map. And that this wave of darkness like radiated out from that. Wow. And, and it was like very complex. But basically, I was shown that there was a huge political event coming. Coming, and that it was actually going to be a sign of that there was a much deeper spiritual battle going on. And now, mind you, at the time. I was not spiritual. Mm -hmm. I was just not. But that vision just totally tripped me out. And at the end of it, like the person who was guiding me through it revealed himself to be like my higher self or some other aspect of me, like shape shifted into me and then called me by a by a name that then sent off this. I had this series of like dreams that were based on a really important past life of mine. I mean, it just completely woke me up. So then when <laughs> then when 9-11 happened. Like it took me a minute to kind of like put it together, right? But I realized two things. One, I was like, holy shit, where was the air defense? There was no pop-up SAM sites around the Pentagon. How can that possibly be? The Russians would have defeated us in the 50s if we didn't have defense against this kind of thing. Like what? Where was the air defense? And I said that to my buddies and I even phrased it to them Socratic method style. I said, what's the first thing you do in World of Warcraft 2, guys? And they said, we got to put up arrow towers, because if you don't put up arrow towers, the other guys are coming with griffin riders and dragons. And like, it's not enough to have a couple of like elf archers on the ground, you get blow blown out. And I said, Yeah, right, you got to have air defense, right? Because the other guy comes in and you don't have air defense, you're fucked, right? And they're all like, Yeah, and I said, Where's air defense around the Pentagon, guys? And they go, they all like, the blood just drained from their faces. They're whiter than you. They all look down and like, kind of got twitchy 
And then one of them started shaking his head and said, no, 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 no. This is exactly what he said. He sounded like he's like, no, uh, uh, no, girl, no. Like, I see where this is going. Out. He said, no way, because that would mean the government was involved. And I go, well, it would seem like that would have to be the case that some element of the government would have to be involved here for that to have happened. But where's the air defense? Yeah. No, no, no. Could the, then the government be involved. That can't be. Blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, you didn't answer my question at all. You're dismissing it. You're like losing your shit on me. You're freaking out, you know? And uh, uh, so I just dropped it. And then like a couple weeks day- later, my weed dealer, funny weed being a common theme here, I guess. Uh, this is twenties in Eugene, my twenties in Eugene, Oregon. So there you go. Oh, uh, Hey, how about that? I lived in Redmond. Cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Right on dude. Yeah. And so I, um, I, uh, was talking to my weed dealer and he was like, have you guys heard these nine 11 conspiracy theories? And I was like, Oh my God, because I, nobody was talking about it. I mean, this is like a week after it happened. And he goes, you got to check out this guy, Mike Rupert, who is like a former LAPD guy and OG and kiss of respect and doff of the hat to fucking an OG who died. One of the original truthers of the 21st century if folks, if you don't know who Mike Rupert is. I'm not saying everything he did was right, but Man, he blew open the crack coming into the ghettos in L.A. via the LAPD and CIA. He confronted a CIA director and shoved it in his face and, like, got the guy to, like, low-key admit that the CIA was involved in running coke into the ghettos in L.A. I mean, he's an OG conspiracy theorist who really took it right at those guys. He was a cop, so he was, like, wouldn't relent. And so... That then started like a spirit or a political awakening. And I had like kind of a combination, like political awakening, spiritual awakening that was kind of like happening in tandem. And um, after that, I spent the next 20, you know, 22 years, like just really, um, really seeking truth. And it was kind of at times it was really political in nature, economics, you know, history, geopolitics, all that kind of stuff. But always there was this understanding or feeling that there was like, you know, this spiritual under undergirding what was happening, the spiritual conflict. And like even that year, I figured out, um, you know, hat tip to Alex Jones for providing the little bit of physical proof that I needed to kind of anchor it. And Alex Jones, controversial figure, probably controlled opposition. Who knows? Like part of the reason I was uh, blown away about 9-11 was that... Um, the original OG conspiracy theorist in a lot of ways, Bill Cooper, uh, Bill Cooper. Uh, predicted it earlier that year. And I knew who Bill Co- Cooper was at that point because I had already read Behold a Pale Horse. And when I found out that he like said, this is it after 9-11, this is exactly what I predicted. And then he got freaking capped and killed. In his front fucking by yard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like six weeks after 9-11. And then all of his flock basically came into the Alex Jones camp and like, he actually really uh, didn't like Alex Jones and thought. No, Alex Jones he hated him. I yeah, listened I to like a thirty-minute rant he had about Jones, which is really interesting. It's funny you can't find that rant anywhere in the YouTube without it being uh, attached to a bunch of anti-Semitic imagery. Oh, of I course. Noticed. All the other versions of it are deleted. The only one they allow up uh, has all this like anti-Semitic imagery that should get that video taken down, and yet there it remains. Interesting. And- uh, almost as though they wanted to, you know, be sure to poison the well of anyone questioning Alex Jones. Anyways, oh, yeah. Alex Jones, to his credit, give credit where it's due, he had done the Bohemian Grove thing by that point. And so seeing the Bohemian Grove, then, you know, I had already read stuff about dark magicians and stuff. And just around that time, October, November of 2001, it came together with me and I knew dark magicians ran the planet. And that was the most unsettling, terrifying thing I can possibly relate because I was certain of it. I just knew because of this. I have something called clear cognizance where sometimes I just know stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and and I often need a long time or years of research to be able to prove what just doop, comes to me, like in a download or whatever. Yeah, you kind of have to like map the external world onto yeah. what's going on on the internet. Dude, I, yeah, I, I totally resonate with that. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, and so I... um. It takes a while to prove sometimes. Absolutely. Right. So I'll hear something or read something. and I'll just be like, no matter how wacky it is, I'll be like, wow, that is true. Right. And um, I was like, shit, you know, dark magicians. And so 
I then just like did all sorts of different spiritual stuff, became a Reiki master. You know, I'd already been learning astrology by that point for a few years. Um, Started to get into magic. I actually was fortunate enough to briefly um, be an apprentice to a a, a literal Siberian shaman, uh, which are actually the only people can actually say they're true shamans. Yes. Everybody else is actually a medicine person or whatever, witch doctor, something like that. Um, It's a catch all term now. Yeah. Right, right. But he was a he was half Inuit and half uh, from Kamchatka, I think is the province or whatever in extreme northeastern Russia. And Mm -hmm. they're a totem pole culture, much like the northwestern native tribes were. And uh, I actually met him and he was carving a totem pole when I met him. And uh, he was actually the first person who told me about what I would come to later describe as Malachians. And he told me, and this was in 2004, he said, Ian, the number one thing that white magicians are, I don't like to use the word light worker because it makes you think of a bunch of people who are in denial of their own shadow. Love and light only. (laughs) Right, right. I'm a supernatural being. Yeah, like, oh, you're harshing my mellow. Can we not? Love and light. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, okay, but we need to actually deal with that and suppressing it within yourself. You need to integrate that, heal it. (laughs) face it so we can heal it in the world anyways so he goes um he says to me and one of the main things a uh, uh, shamans and and like white magic users need to do more than anything else our number one priority is to end pedophilia nobody was talking about pedophilia in 2004 on any large scale right. uh, other than in deep conspiracy theories was that these people were pedophiles and, and dark magicians and you know i had discovered that but it was not a known fact and i didn't bring this subject up he just said it to me and mm-hmm. like out of the blue and i said well uh i said i totally agree but um like what makes you say that it's the most important thing to end and he said well he said and he he gave me a story and i'm just going to paraphrase him because it's been 20 years now or whatever but he said in ancient times in the near east and i will go ahead and say at the beginning of the kali yuga there were a group of dark magicians who were already working with lower astral forces. And one of the dark spirits that they were working with said, there is a greater power that you haven't worked with yet. And they were like, Ooh, what is this greater power? And they probably would be, and this can segue into the whole Luciferian mocking thing. They might've themselves been Luciferians because this is at the tail end of the descending dwarf Yuga or bronze age, mm-hmm. which the bronze and silver ages are ruled by Lucifer. And so They may have very well been Luciferian. Regardless, they were working with lower astral spirits and the spirit told them there's a darker, more powerful spirit that you can work with. And they were like, oh, tell us more. What do we need to do? And they said, you got to Epstein those kids and ritual ritual faction. And that will open a portal to the lowest pit in the lower astral. And so he said a demon god then reaches through those portals and can touch the planet. And that demon God has been uh, dominating the planet ever since they opened these portals. And so we have to stamp out pedophilia because pedophilia is what opens these portals to the lower astral, the lowest part of the lower astral. And if you end pedophilia, then those portals will slam shut and all of that demon God's minions would lose their power in in an instant. And so he said, we've got to end it above all else. He didn't use the term Moloch, but uh, I just find it to be the most useful uh, name for 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 the so-called satanic force. I don't like the term Satan because of two reasons. One, the iconography associated with it is actually the Vatican was trying to beat down on Celts. And so yep. they took the iconography of Kernanos, the god of the wild hunt, who wasn't like some kind of peaceful, friendly god but was nothing like Moloch, right? Like nowhere near, just a nature God, like sacrifice and red and tooth and claw. But, and, and, you know, it did have some um, small amount of human sacrifice involved uh, where they would kill the king and then that would ensure the crops the next year, whatever. And Mm -hmm. so I'm not sitting here in defense of Cronus. I'm just saying it's a distinct deity. And there's too much of this in the truth community of, (laughs) pardon me, of um, willy-nilly using terms as though they're interchangeable when they're talking about distinct de- deities. And as someone who's very 
I mean, there's people who blow my knowledge away to where I look like my knowledge is a grain of sand compared to a beach. I know some people like this. So I'm not trying to say I'm like the end-all be-all expert in esoterica, not, not by any stretch. That said, I know far, far more than the average population. And there's a lot of people who are recently awakened truthers who they don't know what the they, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Just straight up, they don't. No, they're they trading are. action like they're trading magic cards. Like it's exciting. <laughs> and like whether they admit it or not, it's it's hitting. It's pinging on like an like a a rush, like a, an entertainment level in oh, a lot yeah. of ways. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. But uh, yeah, and you know, yeah. I just it came to mind that like, <laughs> real quick in Star Wars, yeah. how does Anakin? join the dark side really like what's the action that really gets him there he kills all the little the little jedi uh, you know the little padawans or whatever yeah i just thought of that i don't i'm sure it's been mentioned in in the the community before but yeah that's what came to mind you know it's, it's like, also the worst it is part of the, the epitome of it because it's it's the killing of of innocence it's the killing of not yeah. killing but it's the the destruction of innocence and the destruction exactly. of of yeah of young life it's 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 um it's like a metaphor to say i'm here to destroy like consciousness itself almost or something yeah. and i've heard that kind of fearful talk uh, and i'm not saying there's no merit to it but it is fearful and and very mythological right but um yeah that theme of yeah the real enemy is trying to like literally negate creation Mm -hmm. and it's like oh huh, that's it does line up in a, a number of ways you know yeah yeah but that's, hey, that's, that's a sidetrack cool um yeah and so uh i kind of lost my chain i'm there. sorry so yeah we, that was a sidetrack uh, yes yeah, so back to the malachi the the, uh, yeah I, I apprentice under the shaman and then um, I don't know. I did, you know, I did ayahuasca ceremonies. I traveled a lot around like Central America and Europe and even to Turkey and, you know, wow. met a lot of really interesting people and read a lot of, uh, you know, just have done quite a lot of reading and been initiated into a few different traditions and so forth. And uh, the real game changer for me was um, a few years ago, I started to dabble in um, magic and I started out with like sigil magic and like Grant Morrison's infamous uh, 1999 disclosure conference speech. Yep. Have you seen that? The black Classic. podium, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where he runs up and goes Whoa! right out of the gate. Like, yeah, like he's like super fired up. And then he admits yep. he's like dropped acid and he says, look for the come up halfway through this. <laughs> but he described sigil magic in it. And he said, don't, don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. And so I did. And it worked mm. immediately. Boom, boom, boom. Like something like it was very petty. I wanted to get laid <laughs> and I did a sigil to get laid. And there was um, this, woman that we hooked up a few times and like i had lost her contact info in my phone and like because i had i was pretty it, it was a long dry spell and i was had tried to find this woman a few times and so after i did the sigil on the way home from work i gold bricked the last five minutes of work and did a little sigil magic and uh i did the sigil and on the way home i was like looking through my phone and i just all of a sudden was like I wonder if what's her name you know i don't want to say her name i wonder if what's her name like man i can't believe i lost her number and so i just typed her name and came right up and i was like what, what? i was like no way i've looked for her name a bunch of times and she has kind of a unique name i'm like there's no way and so i was like fuck it i just i'll text her and i was like hey how's it going she was like oh my god i was just thinking about you so intensely a few minutes ago she's like what are you doing tonight oh <laughs> And so um, I go, whoa. And then I dabbled with a bit more magic. And like, I tried several different methods and just magic works for me really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't for everyone. Uh, but then I started to do uh, Solomonic angelic magic. And, um, you know, I barely did any of the other magic because right away I felt like, ooh, I need to be tread lightly here. You know, I need to not abuse this. And that was kind of a petty thing to use it on. And hmm. And I just kind of like reflected on it. And then I started to do some Solomonic Angelic magic. And I had an ex who uh, was, 
Uh, she was really into magic. She was into really dark stuff. And I don't even understand. Like, I wonder if she didn't use some kind of magic on me because I really, uh, I don't know how I was with this person. But anyway, she initiated me into, um, she started to teach me magic. And she had learned from a very high level magician who's like somewhat pretty famous in Europe, really. He's been dead for a number of years now, but he taught her all kinds of stuff. He was, uh, she was his protege for like almost a decade. And like, he was like, you're the most talented student I've ever had. And she was incredible at magic. Um, uh, had a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, difficult background. And so uh, came out in ways that made not compatible for me at all. And I, I wish her luck and to do well in the world. I just wish she'd get some healing in there. But regardless, she uh, would teach, start to teach me different magical things. And then I'd go, oh, and then you'd do blah, blah, blah. And she'd go, She'd say, how do you know that? That's like a closely guarded secret. How could you possibly know that? And she several times questioned. She was like, are you just bullshitting me? Have you had some training like from, you know, like, I don't know how you would know that. Hmm. And um, I was like, no, I just, I don't know. I just know. And she was blown away. It just happened again and again and again. And so in part, in reaction to her doing all this like darker magic, I was just like, man, I want to do good magic and so <laughs> yeah. i started working with the angels and i was having mixed success sometimes it worked and sometimes it, it didn't because uh that's and angels will veto spells that would bring disharmony into your life as was part of it and part of it was i was just wasn't doing the method right but then i started working with the archangels and one day i asked archangel Razio, who's kind of the gatekeeper to the angelic realms the initial gatekeeper there's many gates Hmm. And I said to him, you know, I feel kind of bad telling these uh, beings of light what to do. And he said, oh, no, don't worry about it. It's literally what the 72 named angels were literally designed to be like, you know, to people would pray to them, do a spell, and then they would bring the result if it was within their purview of what they do. He says, that's what they're literally created to do. So don't feel bad and all. And I said, well, yeah, but I guess what I want to know is, what can I do to serve the celestial current? What can I do to serve the most high? And he goes, now you ask the right question. And he gave me the keys, which I can't share, uh, <laughs> only to people who have been approved, but he gave me the keys to interact with the principalities, which is the highest angelic choir in the third sphere, which is closest to us in terms of vibration. There's then the virtues, powers, and dominions in the second sphere that are further removed from us. And then in the, the the first sphere, which is the furthest from us, there's the Ophanum, Ezekiel's wheel, the wheels within wheels with eyes on the edges. And then there's the Cherubim. And then finally, there's the Seraphim. And so that began a basically two-year journey, 18 months, 20 months, of where I, I happened to be in a place and a time where I had the ability to have a lot of free time if I was disciplined. And I became very disciplined and I did a tremendous amount of rituals with the angels until I worked my way all the way up to where now, now I work with the seraphim and they, my life has completely changed. And, and I can already hear some viewers going, well, how do you know they're not demons? Cause I get oh. that all the time, especially from Christians. Right. Right. Of course. And I right. say, well, do you think demons would help someone end a, 30 year addiction to hardcore pornography would help them with their anger, would get them to start being more compassionate and kind to others, would get them to start devoting their life more to charity and would help smooth out every aspect of their life and make them a better person who's more conscious, caring, loving, and peaceful. Maybe because the Bible says that was born in Council Nicaea and magic. Bad. Right. Right. Like it doesn't say these people, but. To the people who are uh, at least it's, it's the proofs in the pudding, it's yeah. actually, I'll use a biblical quote here, by Yeshua, you shall know them by their fruits. Can and you say it again? You cut, sweet, you cut very out very harmonious right. and very uplifting. You cut out right as you said it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I just got the connection is stable. Jesus yeah. said, you shall know them by their fruits. And he was mm. talking about people who say one thing and do another. But right. it's also true with spirits that one of the things you can do is you can know, like, is is chaos increasing in my life? Am I becoming more uh, self-centered and egotistical? Right. Am I uh, is my life less harmonious? Um, am I becoming more covetous of other people's uh, girlfriends or money or whatever? Like, 
are the seven deadly sins increasing in me mm. or, 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 or is virtue increasing in me? And if the right. answer is virtue, then you can know that you're dealing with, you know, again, you have to observe this for a long period of time, because in particular, I know you like to talk about it much, but gin and other spirits can masquerade as angels. And you do need to be careful of that. So it's not completely without merit, that question. But if over a long period of time, you see the kind of results that I've seen, you can feel pretty comfortable that you're you're working with, uh, you know, angels in this case. Mm-hmm. And so my life has completely transformed. And in fact, you and I are talking as a direct result of angelic magic. And that is, last fall, I was teaching, um, and it's part of this whole crazy chain of events that has completely changed my life. It was just sort of the middle of this crazy chain. Um, I was teaching these students and it was the first time I taught a class instead of individuals angelic magic. And I was teaching these students and I decided the angels were like, you really need to get, you need to get your podcast needs to be heard by more people. There's people who need to hear this message so they can start taking responsibility for their own life. So they start like doing good works in the world, all the stuff you need to have more people hear it. And they encouraged me to do a ritual to increase the visibility of the channel. And I did it and magic uh, can be amplified by other minds. That's part of the reason the dark magicians do the whole revelation of the method thing, like right. the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony, right? Dude, yeah. Uh, right. You're, 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 you're capturing people's minds in the case of dark magic in order to amplify your spell. But in the case of where you're working with other people and, you know, good magic, angelic magic, you know, we all consented to sort of boost each other. We all stated what we're doing explicitly and, you know, we're very, I, I teach my students to be very careful with how they phrase what they'd like to make sure it's in uh, their soul's highest good and in accordance with the divine plan of the most high, things like this, honoring the free will of others, you know, never messing with other people's free will, things like that. But uh, I said, hey, you know, I want my show to get more exposure. And I got done with that ritual. And about two weeks later, it seems uh, Sam Tripoli somehow found my channel with like 450 people in it. And started talking about my channel. Someone told me about him. I reached out to him. He pulled me on the show. And now my channel's completely blown up. Yeah, yeah. And that's a direct result, no doubt about it, of awesome. two of the rituals I did in that. And so I'm actually having uh I, I'm actually interviewing Sam tomorrow for my show to talk about his journey and comedy and so forth. And so yeah, that that uh I, I know that was like the longest introduction of all time, but um Oh no, no, that's yeah, yeah. I uh that that is sort of like my journey that's led me up to this point. Um, it's just it's been a lot of a lot of seeking and a lot of like trying to find what worked and what made sense and what really stood the test of time and what mm-hmm. what was effective, you know. And mm-hmm. and that's true whether it's talking about history and politics or whether it was my spiritual journey. But I really feel like the spiritual journey is primary, and that all the rest of the stuff is just the realm of effect rather than cause. Yeah. And it's so interesting too, because while that is like, in my opinion, I agree that it's no doubt more important. It's more to the core of our existence, our being and everything. Um, it's almost like, uh, there's a lot of traps in the spiritual community, the spiritual world where it's like, it's give it all away to the spiritual world. Um, you know, and I find an interesting synchronicity. I've talked about it in the past, how, um, yeah, and I was a victim of this when I was much younger and taking psychedelics a lot and having my mm-hmm. revelations and yeah, it, it, it was mind blowing. And, uh, it eventually brought me to a lot of different religious studies and things like that. And also quantum physics was mind blowing to me because of the same reasons, right? I was searching through consciousness and what is it and what is this whole mm-hmm. thing, whatever. Um, but the connection with quantum physics that I was making back then was very nihilistic because I was being led by a lot of atheistic rock star like scientists that were everywhere in pop culture. And they've only yeah. proliferated like they're everywhere now, you know, but I was obsessed yeah. with like Dawkins and Sam Harris and and all these these people that were swirling around. And it's, it was a very nihilistic view that was being perpetuated, which is that, you know, look the atom is 90% nothing. And like everything is not, is like almost nothing. So it's all just an illusion, man. And like, Hey, look in Hinduism, man, they talk about Maya. It's an illusion. And I was going right down that path, which it seems as though millions now are going down 
Uh, and it's mm-hmm. not exactly, it's always just part of the story, you know? Sure, the mm-hmm. physical aspect in a way is illusory. However, spirit has us here for a fucking reason, you know? Does that, yeah. make, does, does that make sense? Like, I often oh, say, like, we need more grounding rather than ascending in the spiritual yeah. community, if that makes any sense. Really? I know we're talking about angelic magic, but, you know, that's a perceptual yeah. thing too, I assume. Like, how you view what these principalities are to you, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot of people say spirit guides. Would that mm-hmm. kind of fall under the same terminology? You know, or the same terminology, but the same uh, allegories, the same ideas, same archetypes, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, um, the angels are a distinct class of beings. They have different names in different cultures. You know, a lot of people think angels, like I happen to, uh, the vast majority of what I do with the higher angelic, choirs and spheres is has been given to me through personal gnosis from archangel razio or the principalities or whatever level i was working with have given me whatever keys to work with it uh that said even though it's from a i i i i always start with the the first steps on my ritual are always built off of solomonic magic and uh, there's a lot of, there's a speaking of uh, Psalms, the book of Psalms in Hebrew. A lot of people don't know the book of Psalms are almost all uh, encoded angelic calls. It's actually angelic magic, the book of Psalms, but to the regular person who reads it, they don't understand that that's what they're reading, but it's actually a book of spells, a uh, book of Psalms. Um, you can't just say it and something's going to happen. It, it, it needs to be said in a certain order, but anyways, so I speak Hebrew and so forth and look at Hebrew characters but I do want to make clear to me that the angels are not, they're not Jewish, they're not Christian, they're not Muslim, right? Those three religions uh, took angels into as part of their religion. But uh, the Sumerians, for example, talk about Archangel Michael. So, you know, really? Sumer, yes, Sumer is wow. way before Abraham oh, yeah. and um, therefore way before Judaism. And so, uh, with all due respect to the beautiful tradition that I do practice, which is from a, a Hebrew current, and I want to give credit where it's due. Yeah. Angels themselves are not um, they're not Jewish or, or Christian or, or or Hindu. And in fact, they have um, they have the the, the devas uh, in Hinduism seem to be an aspect of the angels or a different manifestation of that same thing. The angels were just very recently talking about it. So to me, I see angels as a specific class of spirits, um, the same way elementals are a specific class of spirits or the fae are a specific class of spirits or the jinn are a certain class of spirits or the clephotic demons of the tree of death. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's a specific, very arc demon class of demons. I do take some issue with the way the Goetia, uh, the 72 spirits are all called demons. Some of them are nature spirits that kind of got folded in and put into that black and white, good and bad kind of paradigm. Uh, But there's different classes of spirits. And then there's things like there can be deceased relatives or um, ascended masters or demigods or earthbound deities or interstellar deities. There's even intergalactic deities. So there's many different classes of spirits. Can an angel be a spirit guide? In the sense that they're a spirit and they guide you, yes. I think when most people talk about my my spirit guides or whatever, they're talking about something different. For example, I have a spirit guide that is, a, that is a, and this is going to sound insulting or cheesy to some people. It's just it's been this way since I was a little kid. But the white buffalo is is my my spirit animal. It, there's a specific even white buffalo that died in like the early 1900s that I somehow communed with this spirit when I was a kid. It was one of those mystical experiences I had when I was a kid. And he came to me actually right before I met the shaman I mentioned earlier. And I had a whole shamanic initiation dream. And then the next day I met, which included Archangel Michael, and the next day I met him and he said he saw Archangel Michael behind me. It was one of the first things. It literally was the first thing he said to me. And he was the third person who said to me that day. So that white buffalo is a spirit guide. Mm-hmm. And, and and I would say he fits within that. Um, but I wouldn't say that angels per se uh, are, are, a, are a spirit guide the way it's normally used. They can be, but I think it's kind of, I think spirit guide is just kind of like a particular spirit that's taken an interest in guiding your life. 
Mm. And they could be of a very of various different classifications of spirit that would fall under that umbrella. Does that I don't know if that answers. Yeah, no, you. that works. That works. Definitely. I think this might be a good segue into uh because sure. I know you're so versed in history as well. Uh-huh. And uh not just the spiritual side of it. And I I really like where this can go here because uh mm-hmm. you and I seem to have a lot of the same reactions to the to the experience of gnosis and uh it seems like our paths were kind of uh a couple beats were similar you know along the way yeah um i it seems like we became interested in some of the same topics and history being one of them and Mm -hmm. uh you know i've been trying to unfold a lot of a lot of our history for a while and what what topics get a lot of attention and, and things like that. And, you know, you mentioned the Fae and I've been very interested in Celtic lore and, and Mm -hmm. the history of all of it. And I tend to take a lot of like a, like a Velikovsky approach, if you will, to folklore. And I, I often find a lot of evidence to suggest that there's historical human uh origins to a lot of the words we're using here including fey but now i want to clarify that i'm not trying to dismiss the spiritual side of it i'm wondering if maybe we can take this into like a as above so below kind of place you know as within so without because i often find that it is a very fractal thing where you know even if we because I often I battle with like the UFO community, honestly, because I find it's a lot. There's a lot of psy up there and I find there's a lot of psy up in in religion as well. And, and it's just my opinion. But wh- I tr- of course, I, I do what you were talking about, where I have this gnosis and then I try to find it in the real world over the years. I try to dig it out from the, the real world and see if it's real, see if it can confirm anything. Right. And it always feels like a lot of. I mean, people say new age deception, but I know that has a a heavy uh, Christian feeling to it. Like, you know, they think it's all Satanism. I think there's a lot of good and a lot of bad in there and a lot of deception in there. Sure. I think there is a component there. And so I'm interested what your thoughts are on the idea of like, like the Fae, for instance, right? This being a archetype of sorts in consciousness or something Mm -hmm. that also has historical meaning or something like we're using the same words to describe something. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of beating around the bush here because I've done a lot of research into this idea that uh, the fae, this word um, fairies, fair, all of it comes from the idea of fair as in P H A R E as in like Royal nobility. Um, and I've kind of dissected a lot of that area. Like pixies come from the pixie and the pixie was, were druids basically. And I wonder how, how we can tie this together because I'm not dismissing one of the, I don't want to dismiss either one because I think there's a very physical human element here, but then there's this echo or vice versa from the spiritual down to the more dense material planes. If that made any sense. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, I, or I think I understood it didn't. I mean, I'm sure it made sense to you. I think it made sense to me. We'll find out in a second. <laughs> well, um, I'll refine it as we keep talking. How about yeah, that? Yeah, no, of course, of course. So first thing, one thing I would say that would be really helpful is that, um, you know, I talk a lot on my channel about the yugas and the states of consciousness we're in. We'll get into the Luciferian Malachian thing because I know I know it's something you want to hit. And like, oh, yeah. you know, Malachian being the lowest ebb of consciousness, Luciferian being kind of in between and then most high consciousness being the highest while still being in the relative realm of duality. I sometimes talk about a fourth group, the non-dual group that comes out of like the ones, that float, the ones that float up in the mountains, those guys. Pretty much, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, I think some of them, I think that's literally what some of them are. Um, yeah. But uh, so one of the hallmarks of the Malachian consciousness is this, uh, what I call chaotic duality. And that is this belief in you're either with me or you're against me. <laughs> right. Do a little W there, right? Which now, all of a sudden, weirdly, the same people who are protesting against Bush think he's great, literally think he's great. I literally know some of these it's people. Unreal. <laughs> and now they're saying you're either with us or you're against us, right? Which, to me, anytime someone says that to me, 
I'm like, well, it sounds like I'm against you because I don't believe in hive mind bullshit. But anyways, this chaotic duality of everything's black or white and things are either this or they're that. They're never more than one thing. Right. That's a terrible way of looking at things. First of all, I just don't think it's accurate, right? That's why we have metaphors. Metaphors show us that things can have multiple layers of meaning. As someone who's studied esoterica quite a lot, I can tell you that most books like Psalms earlier to the to the non-initiated person, they read it and they go, oh, that's interesting. Like the the shade from the mountains, the, the snow mountains comes down and it rests upon the boughs of the tree. And they don't realize that that's the beginning of a of an angelic call that you're that you're laying the groundwork for a call to Raziel there. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, with, with that particular passage in Psalms, and I didn't say it exactly, but it's it's something like the shadow of the mountains uh, rests upon the bow of the cedar or something like that. And that's the beginning of a, of a chant you say that will summon angels to you. So to the non-initiated person, it's just someone talking about the, the, uh, the mountains in Lebanon and the cedar trees in Lebanon. And to an initiated person, they recognize it as an angelic call, right? Or as part of like an angelic magic ritual. Likewise, there's many, many, many things in life that aren't this or that, but they're both and and more than that. Yeah. There, there's often things that have many layers of meaning, many they encompass many different things at once. They're they're archetypal, but they're also like many fold. They're not just one thing or the other. So I think it's important that you allow for that. So that way, for example, pixies can be referring to the picks who are a very small people. Right. It could be referring to one of the more interesting theories I've heard is that the pygmies of Africa. Right. I forget where they are near the Serengeti. I want to say that the pygmies are really good iron workers and that a lot of times they were captured and brought to various different places to be um, smiths. They would be basically enslaved and turned into smiths. And so it could be referring to the pygmies as well. Mm. It, it also is referring to the pixie in the sense of a fey creature. And those fey creatures, I think, are... What I've learned from Gnosis, just for what it's worth, is that the fey are actually humans who, several great year cycles ago, they were very magical humans who were like absolute grandmasters of magic that culture mm -hmm. and they were fervent about protecting the natural world and they realized that if they didn't do something to protect themselves that they had been singled out to be wiped out by another group of humans and so using their magic they created this isn't the only one again this isn't the singular the veil it is a veil they created a, veil, a magical veil between themselves and they put themselves in the silvery light world and between themselves and, and and us basically and so they vibrate at a different frequency from us and they can at certain times with certain astrological arrangements with certain people who are very in tune whatever they can and and depending on what yuga you're in things like that they can move into our world or bring people into their world so they are a class of spirits to a certain degree, they have a material component to them the same way that jinn are both spirits and they also have a can have a physical form they can manifest. They're made of mm. plasma, but they can manifest as a physical form. The, likewise, the Fae have a physical component and a spiritual component. And so I think that especially when you're looking at the etymology of words uh, that have to do with these kinds of phenomenon, you have to be aware of things like it can be people can be encoding and hiding things for the various reasons. There can just be simple mistakes, right? I think that's what happened with, and I don't want to derail, but I think that's what happened with Tartaria is I actually uh, think it's uh, talking about the Mongols and yeah. that, um, oh, they were called, nice. they were confused with the Tartars because what happened was people who weren't right there interacting with those people would talk to other people and maybe even uh, telephone game style was two or three people's removed they had read scholarly works and they just simply made a mistake when they were translating or talking about whatever. And so just mistakes slip in, right? Or someone sees 
a, a fairy being and they describe it to their parents and they're like, well, that sounds like the Picts, but we wiped them out like 20 years ago. But huh, so it sounds like you saw Picts E, right? And so then people conflate a fey being with a race of people, the Picts, who existed, who maybe were wiped out recently. Do you see what I mean? Like words have a funny way of they can just be sloppy, but they can also be uh, multi-meaning at the same time too. So it's kind of hard to say. Absolutely. I'm not sure if yeah. that answered your question. Well, no, no, cool. No, this opens a lot of doors because, you know, you mentioned the the iron and I, I don't know how unrelated or related this could be, but I've also this this gentry of priests, as they were called, this Pixi, um, were in Cornwall, England, which was also the birthplace of tin mining. And the and the Phoenicians were trading tin with Cornwall directly. I and Ooh. it's very it's an interesting connection because I've also done a lot of work to to kind of look at the Anunnaki in a different way and with help from amazing researchers and authors that have kind of led me on different ping points, you know, and I, I like the Tuatha Dé Danann from Ireland, these original ones, right? Mm -hmm. We can find them in Scythia as the Tuatha Dé Anu, which is nuts. And then of course you could just go a little bit further and you got Anunnaki and you have a lot of this talk about the 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 dragon lords of Anu and stuff like that. These, and they're talking about the Scythians, the Can the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, really in some perspective. And so I I really do think there's this like you were talking about this veil, right? And I kind of jive with that where it's like we have this physical human drama going on, but we don't see the epic painting that's going on far beyond this right. this limited perspective perhaps is that yeah. seems like the bridge in my opinion you know mm -hmm. yeah 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 and and i actually want to circle back to something you said earlier just because i want to th throw out a piece of ancient wisdom there you were talking about how people are obsessed with like oh the world's illusion whatever like maya right. and like i was at least <laughs> dead materialism which by the way dead materialism mm. is just a couple steps beyond harm of children in terms of that you can know you're talking to someone stuck in the lock-in consciousness if they yeah. believe in dead materialism i'm not saying that person worships Moloch or harms children okay there's no. plenty of atheists who are the awesome people who are just trying to do what's right and nine times out of ten they had uh bad parents who were christian or an uncle who was uh, abused them who was christian or the priest abused them as Christian or whatever. Uh, I've almost never met an atheist who didn't have an extreme axe to grind almost always at the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, that um, was put there, man. It was put there over the gen the whole 20th century, but that's a whole absolutely. other fucking conversation. And, <laughs> and so, you know, and then now like a really popular one is, which is to me just a really, really, really lazy repackaging of the idea of Hindu Maya or not Christian Gnosticism and the Demiurge and stuff like that. And they're like, it's a simulation. It's a computer. Okay. Who made the computer, bro? Somebody yeah. did. Okay. So, but how is that any different from the Hindu concept of that, that computer that our simulation is within is part of the mind of God and God creates the world through whatever. It's the same fucking thing. You just dumbed it down and made it stupid. The and Atman, easily... as you were, you know, I've read your blog right. and, you know, the Atman, it, it, yeah, exactly. That's what... and, and, and so you, you mentioned how that frame, you know, there's also the thing where people spiritually bypass, right? Where like something bad happens and they're like, I shall retreat to the witness and not let this impact me emotionally. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Like uh, that is unhealthy and there's a perfect cure to it. And it's just three lines and it's ancient wisdom. And it's, in my opinion, if you fully understand this, and I don't mean like you intellectually understand, I mean, you have that release on all levels, which I haven't had that myself because otherwise I'd be enlightened, but it goes like this. The world is illusion. And very few people get beyond the idea of that things are just like what I can see. You right. Know, like this is a jar of vitamins, right? That's it. Most people ne never get, beyond that they get up they go to work they have sex they vote democrat and they die someday right and they never ever examine their life or any of their assumptions whatsoever they just immediately say wow like there's nothing wrong with these democrats i'm not even going to begin to scratch the surface here and do any thinking or analysis whatsoever right there's a lot of people who are just stuck in 
they don't get that the world is illusion. They haven't even taken step one on this journey. Right. They're at right. step zero, right? Then there's people who go, aha, the world is illusionary in nature. But what is it? What is the nature of that illusion? And the second stanza is it goes, the world is illusion. Brahman alone is real. Yes. And Brahman is like the Hindu concept of the God mind, the, the pervasive consciousness that's all throughout the universe, which by the way, more and more experimental physics, which is the only kind that matters, is showing that the universe is, air quotes, mental in nature. They're they're trying really hard to stay away from panpsychism or anything that smacks right. up. Anything they'll call it non-locally than... real. They'll say that, but they'll, they won't, yeah, go to yeah, They're, they're terrified of anything that smacks of even a whiff of spirituality. I'm like, do you guys even read Niels Bohr or like some of the... the like, but so you've just to cut in real quick, you've helped me refine my my own thoughts about this, uh, you know, and separating some things, because what I find is this uh, obfuscation of Atman, if you will, if we'll use that terminology, um, is part of this alien disclosure. It's part of a lot of that, quote unquote, new age deception, where there's a multitude of, of things going on. It's not actually just go back to source see that we are all this atma we are all part of this one source emanating outward like a fractal in a way i say it a lot um that is the stuff that i find is never popular the idea mm -hmm. that the personality ain't real and that you don't really get to take that one with you either like we're all you look at the new age man we're all fucking quantum superheroes that and i think i think please correct me if i'm wrong i still feel like this is rooted in an absolute fear of death that they are hoping that okay so all right so after i die then okay i can be in the quantum world and i'll go to another parallel in the in the 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 multi multiverse or, or something like that it's this very superhero hope to god i go on this desperate clinging, which is the opposite of what the new age is supposed to be modeled after, which is this deep ancient understanding of consciousness and, and everything, which is not that it's not that clinging at all. So yeah, that was a word salad, but I'm sure you can do no, something. I mean, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of what you said is interesting and, and, and we can actually, um, I just want to wrap up this thought and then we yes, can look into the new age and how that ties into Luciferian Malachianism. Most sure. We'll get to that at some point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So this is great. So the world is illusion. Brahman or the mind of God alone is real. So it, it, it's very rarefied error to even get to that second realization where you have what the Japanese called a satori, a momentary glimpse of the truth of the universe or enlightenment, right? Right. Which I've had many satoris, none of them have really stuck. None right? of them. They all get um, rest. <laughs> and so the third line, though, is the key. The world is illusion. Brahman alone is real. The world is Brahman. Oh, that's right. Yes. And I've heard that before. I love that three lines. And, and so yeah. it's so deep because first you need to accept, okay, this world is illusionary. That allows you to loosen. Now you're not so fixated on, yeah, am I going to die or I need to make enough money or whatever. You start to loosen. You, you kind of loosen your attachment to I am in you know, and, and that means this, that, and the other thing, because my mommy and daddy said this, and then I got to be a big boy. And you know what I mean? All this yes. nonsense we have built up around our ego, built around that basket of our name, right? right. So it, it starts to loosen it, and you start taking things less per personally when you realize the world is illu illusory. And then you hopefully will then become curious. You discover, okay, wow, everything is consciousness. Right. But a lot of people get stuck there and they want to be in denial for all kinds of reasons. They're afraid of death, like you just said, or um, maybe they're not very attractive and they're not getting laid enough. And so that's <laughs> painful. Or maybe yeah. like me, they had a very traumatic childhood. They want to get away from that pain or whatever kind of material uh, world problem that they're trying to escape from. And they do that um, spiritual bypassing bullshit. Yeah, yeah. But that third stanza brings it all home. So the world's illusion, everything is the mind of God. Why did God go to the trouble of making this place? Is right. it just so we can go, oh, the world's illusion, I'm done, I'm out? How does that make any fucking sense? Like it doesn't. Does it make sense that that um the highest achievement is to that direct connect with 
with source to where you're like Ramana Maharshi, the great sage in India, and you have completely transcended the ego and all that stuff. Yes, I would agree that is. But the world was made in order for things to occur within it, including enlightenment. And while that is, in a certain sense, the ultimate goal, that that, that release and that uh, leveling up, the spiritual evolution to me is that ultimate goal. And in a way, you're saying, you know what, I'm just punching out. Yeah. When you when you do when you do the, the enlightenment thing, and I'm not trying to disrespect, I have nothing but respect, you're choosing, you're saying, okay, I'm done with this game. Right. And and and, and you're emanating this peacefulness because now you're more in vibration with source. And it is a way out. And it is true that if you're in the material world, it's just the nature of the material world, you will suffer. Right. I sat with a great spiritual teacher once and I said, wow, you know, I've had all these tutorials and all this stuff, and I feel like I have more to do in the world. And he just, he looked at me with these beautiful peace eyes because he was enlightened. And he said, yes, that simply means you need to suffer more. Right. And that just was like, hit me like a wrecking ball. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> I heard the truth in it, and I had to grapple with that for a while. But a while back, I just decided, you know what? I'm fucking, I'm in, I'm in. I'm all in. Right. I'm in the game. I get a solution, which is very freeing. I don't actually seek it at all. In fact, I try and avoid it, but I don't fear death. Right. I, I really, really don't. I, I'm right. kind of intrigued on a certain level. Like what, what exactly does that process look like? I've talked to like deceased relatives. I've talked to spirits, but m much is, is still wrapped in mystery. And that, and that in many ways is the ultimate mystery for for a living incarnated being is what is death like sure you, oh you'll reincarnate and whatever but what is that process what is it experientially like and it's right, very intriguing to me again i don't seek it but i'm actually not afraid of it because i'm certain about reincarnation and that's very freeing it's mm -hmm. part of the reason i think it was removed in the early stages of christianity it's pretty clear to me that jesus knew reincarnation existed he said I think it's Isaiah has returned or maybe Elijah, either Isaiah or Elijah has returned and it's John the Baptist. <laughs> I don't well, know yeah. how you can interpret that as anything other than reincarnation, but anyways. Well, that's so interesting. So that's still like, okay, so let me wrap my head around this. So we mm -hmm. are all the Atman, right? We're all one consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, Atman is like your, your uh, facet of a gem with bajillions of facets okay right? okay yes like, you're right okay so you're many atmans yes yes there's many atmans and then and then they, they all sort of protrude if you will from from brahman which is the ultimate it's the differentiation of uh that universal consciousness but it attain it obtain it retains many of the attributes of brahman consciousness okay but it, it's also what individuates your soul so okay so that's this is always the thing that i yeah it's almost like i'm in denial of it or something the individual soul i always i i it's almost like i talk about this topic often i po i, I propose questions and, and ideas to challenge this often for some reason it's like i i you know i try to have so much discernment that i can't even let myself accept that we're not all just one. It's to me, it feels more like God's playing with action figures in the backyard. It doesn't really, you know what I mean? Like I haven't, I guess I just haven't had that experience of that. All the action figures are, are in truth sentient on their own. And I, yeah, I, I guess I mean, I've always worried about that. It's just an aspect. That's like saying, you know, like, does this fingernail have independent existence? Well, yes, it's in the fingernail, my right hand pointer finger. I can identify it. It's different from the one on my left finger, right? Yeah. There's there's definitely variation and difference. They're both nails, so they're like, but in some amount of degree, but they're also part of me. And this metaphor, the fingernails I have are different people, right? Different Atmans, mm -hmm. but they're all part of God, right? Fair. You know what I'm saying? So yes. like, it's where you want to, the, the mind... I mean, in a certain sense, yeah, there is no, ultimately, like, everything is one. It's it's not even one because one implies other. So it's non-duality. It's the, it, it's the, yes. it's the, and I was very into this for a long time. The um, Advaita Vedanta is the, mm, is yes. the school in uh, Hinduism, which talks about this a lot. And so 
I think that's the ultimate truth is that, uh, you know, God is both everything and nothing simultaneously. It contains everything, but it also has no individual attributes because any attempt to describe it, including by elimination, is inherently limited and therefore yeah. cannot be. So, yeah. um, well, I mean, said. in a certain sense, that's true. But also, like, you know, Lao Tzu said that the one gives birth to the 10,000 things, mm. right? I mean, you can't argue that y you, I mean yes we're both human and yes ultimately we're both part of god but i mean we're having a conversation how does that work if, <laughs> if there isn't any differentiation whatsoever i mean i actually had a, a psychic hit on you saying that that we can talk about offline because i think cool. it's uh, personal but sure uh, i will i will tell you what came through, through to me uh, offline and and, nice. and just for listeners it's um i i'm not about to share something personal for someone like in public um <laughs> yeah so Geez, man, so this is truly a deep share. Like I was expecting more to me, um, surfacey type stuff. Like you know, <laughs> talking about these, uh, you know, the spiritual war that's going on, on on planet Earth or whatever. But you went, you went to the the deepest place possible, really. You right? know, I what accidentally do that. Of the universe and our role within it, and I have a bad habit of doing that, you know. But I think it sets a good primer for everything else. Often, you know, especially when we're talking about this deep, you know difference between like history and spirituality and you know the name of this game here that we're kind of talking about is duality even if it's a false one you know uh the malachians yeah. versus luciferians the what really hit me most we'll start this off here what really hit me the most was that what i've been working on for a while is this just vicious opposing philosophy that again i think comes from a fear of death versus not a no fear of death perhaps maybe maybe that's a hypothesis but that this rooted duality in uh you know a disagreement in what this experience is or what you know something along those lines branches out throughout everything else and when you start describing the attributes of malachian versus luciferian it mm -hmm. it hits home to me on that level on a deep level. Yeah. It, it just really gets me there because it feels like it really is a very good way to describe these, uh, the, whether it's fake or not like this opposing view that may maybe has been going on forever. I often call it a family feud because we are all part of this one human family or one altogether. And it does feel like there's this division Mm -hmm. behind the scenes as well and yeah maybe some of that's deception maybe it's some of it's real but yeah i just find that division between malachian and luciferian very central to human nature and human behavior that we've witnessed over and over again really cool yeah, that's awesome brother do you mind if we take a quick break and then i actually sent you a visual aid for that and then i want to sure we jump into this so get, give me just a minute no problem no problem pause it or what have you yes right you know, if I can figure that out. <laughs> All right. And we are back. So yeah, Ian just gave me this excellent uh, visual to share as well for this duality that we're talking about here. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, if you, uh, if you look at this, so, so, so this can be, again, thinking back to that multiple, multiple layers of reality that things aren't just one thing or another but they can be multiple things this is uh for some people you can look at it as this is a psychological or mental uh construct meaning that people have certain like mental patterns or psychological patterns that they exemplify or you can see this as people having a certain vibration right or wavelength like that they're either lighter and higher vibrating or they're slower and more densely vibrating, or you can see it in terms of that <clears throat> there are three distinct deities known as Moloch, Lucifer, and the Most High, whose name has been lost. Quick side note, I'm gonna go ahead and piss off your Christian audience here. Uh, <laughs> the angels have told me that the Most High, right? And if you look in both the Book of Psalms, which I mentioned earlier, but also Jesus very often uses the term Most High. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, he doesn't really, and I don't believe he ever did, use the term Jehovah or Yahweh uh, because he is not an emissary of Jehovah or Yahweh, who, in my opinion, are uh, Mars, Mars, like the planetary god Mars. It's just a Mars um, god. It's just a war god. Where And Moloch is like uh, the lower aspect of Saturn. And the Most High is more like the... Uh, it's the, the higher aspect of the sun and the higher aspect of Jupiter kind of together. Jupiter Kazemi, when it's zero degrees conjunct the sun, uh, is kind of like the best energy to describe the most high. But that being, which is the God of the angels, and it's the God for whom Yeshua was an emissary of, right? And that'll really piss off the Christians. Um, <laughs> I, I was raised Christian. I love Jesus and Yeshua. I... Uh, think that there's tremendous, tremendous value in Christianity if you listen to what he actually said, yep. which what he actually said is pretty darn good. And whenever there's kind of something in there where Jesus all of a sudden, other than flipping over the tables, that I'm certain is real. Anytime Jesus kind of like all of a sudden says something, you're like, did he, you know, like that sounds a little violent or bad or negative or exclusionary or with us or against us. Hmm. That was probably not actually said by him. That was probably shoehorned in by Counts of Nicaea or, or one of the other editors of the Bible. Right. Um, and, and you just kind of have to feel into the energy of it. All the stuff that Jesus said that was super positive and healing and really um, inclusive, and I don't mean it in the modern woke sense, I mean it in the sense of that, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, for example, Jesus said, I am the son of God just, and then deleted, redacted, just as you are all the sons and daughters right. of God. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Right? And yes. Jesus, I say again, you are God. Ye are gods. Right. And, no, you yeah, didn't and, mean it that way. And, and <laughs> Jesus very clearly to me is speaking um, about how to establish yourself in this most high consciousness and vibration. You can call it Christ consciousness. It's a great way of discussing it. Hmm. I believe intensely that Jesus was an exemplar and that he wanted for others to behave as he did. Right. Not wear a cross around their neck and bludgeon other people who thought differently than them. That's Moloch through the um, back. You're supposed to uh, ascend uh, to your Christus, right? The crown. Exactly. Absolutely. And and I mean, like, there's all sorts of additional stuff in there. And again, it's, it's not one thing or the other, but I don't want to get too, too lost in the weeds in that. But that's the reason I use the term most high. Most yeah. high is used frequently in Psalms. Uh, the most high is the term that the angels themselves use. They say that the closest that there is that's currently existing in our vibration on our planet, which is just too low right now to have it, is Iawe, the vowels. Oh. The vowel sounds is the closest to the name of the Most High. But the name has been lost. It'll be revealed as we move out of Kali Yuga here in 2025. I'm not saying it'll be revealed instantly like March 21st, 2025. I'm saying it'll come back into the world probably first in a very small select group of people will be able to do it we simply the vibration of the word is simply too powerful and high vibrational to exist in Kali Yuga. it's too dense right now energetically and that word vibrates way too high the true name of uh the most high and again the most high is not big g god the universal god the most high is simply the most harmonious aspect of the of the ultimate creator god it's an earthbound deity that's the most harmonious loving aspect of that ultimate creator here on earth just as moloch is the most destructive nasty horrible aspect again of that great creator god which people don't like to hear this but that great creator god the ultimate big g god who's beyond any description would of course include all evil all evil and people right. don't like that because oh why do bad things happen to good people above and it's like you know like that's a deep philosophical rabbit hole we're not going down right now so with that in mind, there is a literal deity named Moloch. There's a little literal deity named Lucifer, and there's a literal deity whose name is lost currently, who we refer to the Most High. But these also represent three stages of consciousness within right. humans. And the lowest consciousness is this Molochian consciousness, and it emanates indeed from this deity Moloch, who we uh, referred to earlier, who touches the world with what harm to children. You'll notice that the absolute lowest uh ebb of consciousness down here we have epstein style harm of children for malachianism and that's reflected and reversed the mirror image the most high the, the most important 
attribute of the most high, the ultimate attribute is that innocence is protected. It's right. in total opposition to innocence must be destroyed at every turn. Right. Um, I sometimes the say that. The, yeah, exactly. I sometimes say the best way to describe these three levels of consciousness is Malachians are people who their core trait is self-hatred. Yeah. And they then extend that and project that out into the world. Right. And so they do things like dead materialism, slavery, physical torture, chaotic duality, parasitism, might makes right. And they want material stagnation for humanity because they, they kind of just they hate themselves. So they sure as hell hate everyone else. We know a lot of these people. With Luciferians, and this links into the New Age stuff you were saying earlier, with Luciferian consciousness, man is at the center. So narcissism is the central trait of Luciferianism. It's putting man before God. Right. But you can see how that ends up in a practical way being way better than these psychopaths that are self-hating and just want to kill and become serial killers and slavers and so forth. If you look down here in Malachianism, you have things like hive mind, dead materialism, slavery, Epstein style harm of children, chaotic duality, parasitism, physical torture, might makes right. That's important. Remember that one. Oh, yeah. Material stagnation for humanity. That's the part of Malachian consciousness that's absolutely only for Moloch. And any of those things, but especially the Epstein style harm of children, is a calling card that you can know that you're dealing with that energy of Moloch. Right. Indeed, it's required that Epstein style harm of children for Moloch to touch the world. What confuses a lot of people is this next sphere, the Luciferian sphere, and especially that it has a ton of crossover with the Malachian sphere. So where Luciferians and Malachians are the same, uh, at the highest, it's funny to say, but at the highest ebb of consciousness for Malachians is conquest, competition, desire for power, ruthlessness, and hierarchy. Hmm. That's actually a little bit better than the, the traits that are down below if you look at them, but they're still quite negative. And the thing is, Luciferians are very conquest oriented. They want to dominate. They believe in hierarchy. They believe that some people are just better than others. They right. don't believe in the divide and right of kings. They believe in the guy who puts in the elbow grease and the hard work to get to the top. They believe in the perfected man, but they do desire power and they are ruthless. Where Luciferians stand on their own and are different from the most high faction of the Malachians are they believe in enlightened self-interest. That is, where if you put yourself first in a certain kind of way, it has a positive knock-on effect if everyone behaves that same way. They mm -hmm. also believe in rule of law over man. They believe in a republic rather than a kingship, for example. Right. And you'll notice rule of law, is they break away from this idea of might makes right. And as we start talking about some examples of Luciferians, you'll see how they're forever in the courts. They talk about the law all the time. They want to change the laws. They talk about how when they get in office, they're going to change certain laws. They're always referring to the law because they mm -hmm. believe in the rule of law over man. Whereas the Malachians are like, Oh, yeah, I love the law when it allows me to enslave you and physically torture you. <laughs> then I'm all about the law. But the minute it doesn't work for me, then I will just go ahead and break it all day, every day. Right. The Luciferians also are unique in that they believe in meritocracy. Right. That's not something held by either of the other two factions. The, the most high faction thinks that everyone has this inherent natural um, divine right to a certain like kind of amount of respect and dignity and material circumstance whereas the luciferians are like no uh, uh like you need to earn it like that's a bit of social darwinism there but they believe in like they want to perfect mankind lucifer appeals to people by saying don't humans deserve a turn haven't we heard too much of like the devil ruling us or god ruling us shouldn't we go our own way Shouldn't we just develop humans to the most maximum potential and put us at the center? And by the way, maybe also that guy who gave you the hot tip to do this in the first place. Good old <laughs> Lucifer, right? right? So yeah, they yeah. put themselves they put man at the center, but kind of right next to that is Lucifer, right? Oh, absolutely. You're talking about my past. Like literally, I was a yeah. teenager reading these books and going, Holy crap, the devil's the good guy. You know, and, and it's such an obvious thing that can happen to a million people, like so many people, a generation of people out there, you know, but they stay there, like you say. 
Yeah, for sure. They believe very much in honoring contracts, right? They, they're like, if we're going to have l- rule of law and meritocracy, it's going to require contracts. It's going to require us that we codify things and that we set it up a certain way so that we can have enlightened self-interest, rule of law, and meritocracy all play out. If we don't honor contracts, if we don't have rule of law, we can't really have meritocracy. If people are just going around, might make it's right. It's chaos. We don't want that. We want to have like an upward motion for like humanity. And if you look now at the upper, <clears throat> the higher octave of Luciferianism, you see cooperation. You see advancements in arts and sciences. You see the spiritualization of humanity, new age. You see improved material well-being of humanity. You see liberty and free will. And that's where the Luciferians share traits with the Most High. What's interesting is this information came to me um, basically channeled from the angels, from Gnosis, from the angels, and some other spirits. And I was astonished when I recently went on a philosophy page and I saw Luciferianism like outlined. I guess it's actually kind of a semi-official thing. And they said a couple of interesting things. They said, we hate Satanists. We're not Satanists and fuck Satanists. And they also said our, our approach to Abrahamic faiths are live and let live. If they leave us alone, we'll leave them alone. But that doesn't mean we won't try and convince them that we're right. We'll definitely do that. But we're not going to try and like get in there and might makes right, you guys, the way that the Malachians do. The Malachians, yeah. whenever they catch a whiff of the Most High, they're like in there with the hammer right away. They hate the Most High with every fiber of their being. It's literally what they stand in opposition to. Right. And this is a big part of what confuses everyone. There's also this quality of Luciferianism of Luciferian confusion. They have a cloak around them, and both sides. Right. Both the extreme ends of the bar magnet, the most high and the Malachians, they both mistake Luciferians for Malachians. Both sides do it. <laughs> That's the funny thing. The Malachians think they're Malachian because the Malachians are very dumb and dull, actually. All the brilliant stuff. Oh, Ian, what about the Great Reset? Seems like they're pretty smart. No. Their Luciferian consigliaries are very smart. Their Luciferian science. Scientists and advisors and think tanks are incredibly intelligent, crackling with intelligence. But you see this thing where it says desire for power and ruthless and hierarchy. The only way that the Luciferians could have their hands on the level levers of power during the Kali Yugas when Moloch reigns is by kissing the ring of Moloch and the Malachians. And they have to work under them. That's changing. That's Dude. changing. Right, right okay, now. So real quick, real quick, I want listeners to remember all the talks we've done with Dwayne Hayes right now, because we've been talking deeply about what was happening in the beginning of the 20th century and who was subversively taking over all the universities and everything. The, these these ideas were being put through it's it's and the way you put this chart up it's like this was as you said it's changing and this is it's coming out in the open i think it changed quite a while ago and it's just been this is part of all of our programming in a way so i wonder if you could touch on the idea that you know where malachian it's almost like if you think back a long time ago where this Malachian idea could have been ruling over the planet, it would be a very exoteric kind of world where all of it is out in the open, but you're being ruled over by physical means and sword and, and axe and all that. Whereas this, I could compare it to this Luciferian would be still very evil, but it, it's all subversion. It's all the esoteric side of things. So I wonder how what you think about that. Yeah, I, I think there's a I, I think there's a lot of I think you're right on the money there. I, I just want to real quick just to wrap it up, just to Sorry, real yeah. quick talk about the most high principles that are just most high, and then I want to I want to answer that question. So real sure. quick, principles that are unique to the most high is non-hierarchical union. That is not some communist utopia. Okay. I want to be clear about this. This isn't a political thing, right? This is this is when we reach this stage of consciousness in the Sat Yuga, the golden age, this will be automatic and we'll automatically have non-hierarchical union, but 
we'll have differentiation between us. We'll recognize that we're all part of God. We're all snow in the snowbank, but we're also simultaneously unique snowflakes within that snowbank, if you will. Within that, there's perfect trust. There's no longer a need for contracts, and there's certainly not might makes right. There's perfect trust, right? Mm -hmm. There's also an understanding that all is one and all is God. There's also symbiosis. That's where we work together in our mutual strengths, like enhance each other beyond the sum of its parts. There's also harmonious duality, specifically divine masculine and divine feminine are honored. Yes. And the understanding that those two forces permeate all aspects of the universe. Mm -hmm. That's harmonious duality that works perfectly, as opposed to the chaotic duality of the Malachians. You're either with us or you're against us. Right. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, it's like positive and negative electricity in order to get electrical current to flow, things like that. Yes. Then there's individuated telepathy will be an aspect of what will occur because like our, we'll be at such a spiritual stage because of this spiritualization of humanity that all of our gifts will open up. And among other things, there'll be individuated telepathy. And finally, the highest and most important principle of the most high, the absolute core is innocence is protected above all else. And that's both the innocence of, of nature and also of children. And I don't mean like, basically we would have and will have technology that will work in perfect harmony with nature without being destructed. And will actually work to minimize our impact on nature, not some bullshit Davos, global warming, eat the bugs, bullshit, right? But again, that's them perverting this desire people have for, uh, you know, protecting innocence of nature and protecting the garden, right. which we were told to do in the Bible, right? Mm. The reverse of that is to hijack that. And that's all the Malachians can do is invert. They're not creative at all. The Luciferians, right. by contrast, are insanely creative. In fact, they're way more creative than the most high faction because the most high faction recognizes everything's already perfect, right? Right. Whereas the Luciferians are like, let's see what us humans can do. Yeah, it's like everything's broken. Let's see what's what we can do with this magic that we have. Yeah, and I and do so, agree with that. Yeah. And so the last point, just to tie this all off, is what I've been told. And one of the, you know, some people who are very learned might say, wow, that sounds a lot like R Rudolf Steiner's idea of Araman, Christ, the Antichrist. And um, what's the third one? Let's see, Araman, Christ, Antichrist. And Lucifer, right? And it is it is similar, but where where the information that I've been given uh, is is what I'm what I've displayed here. And in addition, linked to that, and this one kind of blew my mind, is that during the Kali Yugas, which the last one began about six thousand years ago, right? The descending Kali Yuga, the Nadir, the lowest point, was around the time of King Solomon, and ever since the time of King Solomon, we've been in the upward Kali Yuga, where the consciousness is rising, but still super dense and horrible, slavery, wars, pedophilia, all that stuff. But consciousness is rising now. Moloch rules the the Kali Yuga with an iron fist and is unassailable cannot be overcome there can be pockets of resistance there can be bursts of luciferianism like for example the renaissance the enlightenment mm -hmm. the founding of the united states the internet there's been these bursts of luciferian consciousness coming out more and more and more and there was even occasional bursts or pockets around the world of surviving golden age enclaves of the most high most mm -hmm. of those have been crushed, although those are going to be rolled out again here in the not too distant future, Golden Age Enclaves. Uh, it's something that actually have been mandated by the angels to work on. Um, so during the Bronze and Silver Ages, Dwarpa and Treta Yuga, Lucifer rules. And the Luciferian consciousness is the dominant one on the planet. And then finally, during the Golden Ages of Sat Yugas, the Most High rules, and the Most High is unassailable. And during the era of the golden age, basically Malachianism will be all but unknown and it will be ultra on the ultra fringes and very, very exceedingly rare and basically just won't exist for all intents and purposes. It'll be pretty much just not able to exist. And so that, that is the, the presentation on these different sorts of uh, levels of consciousness. 
And so um, I want to answer your question. I want to give some concrete examples of, okay, well, who's a Malachian, who's a Luciferian? Blah, sure, blah, blah. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what, can you can you repeat the question you had? I'm sorry. I just wanted to tie that off with less to get. Oh, along. yeah, no problem. It's um, it's just so this is why I really resonated with your work, because a lot of the, the things that you kind of describe in these two different groups, uh, I've been researching, too, for a long time. And I, I look at. Uh, this idea of moving from exoteric to esoteric because oh, yeah. it, it absolutely happens. It happened. And it, the Rosicrucians, there was a saying, and I can't remember who the author was, and I can't find it now either, but it was something mm -hmm. along the lines of like, after a certain point of time, the book is opened. And then after another certain point of time, the book is yet again closed something along those lines and hmm. it did kind of echo this idea of stages and ages but it also echoed this idea of at one point no one gets the information other than us and then this other stage is like well let them have it in a it's a different type of well as we're calling it there's a lot of slavery mental slavery emotional slavery cyber slavery all of this is happening to us and it's it is really hard to separate the malachian and luciferian sometimes because it almost seems like two different almost like a hegelian dialectic if you will where it's mm. And, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are there. Like the subversion that's that goes on now versus the rule by sword and bloodshed and conquering in the old world. It seems like there wow. is that exoteric rule where the, the knowledge was everywhere. Perhaps you okay. can even look to the more like fantastical uh, mythology of like of Tolkien and stuff where like magic yeah. was kind of there, but you know, it, but the threat was evident in your face of like being hunted down and killed by the more powerful, the more, the Kings, whatever we, you want to call it. It wasn't this uh, paradise time necessarily. And yeah. then oh, I'm not trying necessarily to look at it historically in a linear fashion, but it kind of works where yeah. we are moving more towards, as you said, this more Luciferian shit is getting out more and more. Yeah. And it's just interesting that, the old way versus the new way, as I like to say sometimes, is this Malachian Luciferian where exoteric, esoteric, is it two different tactics? Like you mm. said, they kind of have to work under Malachians. Do the Malachians at least think they have something up their sleeve? That's good. like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Cause I'm sure they see the tide changing. Obviously they're bowing down now, you know, I, I, I don't think so at all, actually. Um, do you mind closing the thing so I can see? Oh, sure. Thing? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm just sorry. Just talk to me with the conversation. Um, so first of all, fantastic. I hadn't considered that, uh, previously the way that rule by the sword was the dominant force for, well, basically until, I don't know, the past <sighs> 200 years or so, 300 years, maybe, um, as we're sort of approaching the end of Kali Yuga. Um, and then there's been, you know, this moving forward of, uh, sort of settler means of control, which is definitely on the luciferian side of things i hadn't really considered uh that particular thing it's it's interesting i will say for what it's worth the angels have told me that magic functions very differently depending on what age you're on uh and they also mm. said it functions completely differently on different planets and that it's uh, what we know here is almost worthless on other planets oh. um but uh they've said that for example the Ophanim, um, apparently in super ancient times, the last Bronze Age, they could still come down and kick ass and like, like smite people who were particularly evil. They have to be basically Malachian and then they could smite them. Mm. Uh, there seems to be a rule. Uh, one of the things they've told me is that um, Malachians can, Malachians have right during natural law. The angels always are in accordance with natural law. And natural law states that during the Kali Yugas, all this bad shit happens. Mm. Right. And so the angels are like, well, bad shit happens. That's just, that is the order. It's part of the great unfolding. It's part of the great plan. There's people reincarnate. And so they're just staring deeply into the abyss right now. That's just the <laughs> stage of conscious humans are at. We're not going to interfere with that. Other than when humans ask us honoring free will 
to intervene, then we can. But the angels are, um, they're getting stronger. Like they're, they're, they've even been getting stronger in my own experience in terms of the way their magic works. But right now, demonic magic stops on angelic magic right now, because it's just right now we're in Kali Yuga. And so the demonic, the lowest part of the lower astral, not that kind of slightly lower astral where Lucifer is, but the super lower astral where Moloch is, the, those like uh, the clephotic demons and so forth, that magic is super powerful and super quick to manifest right now. Yeah. But because we're in a time in which Malachianism has that dead materialism aspect, that exoteric aspect, magic works in that something you can't see happens and then the material world shifts, but it's not like you point your fingers and lightning comes out of your fingers. <laughs> yeah, like Hollywood wants you to think of magic. Right. However, during other eras, it may very well work like that, actually, meaning that that that, that it will uh, function differently in different eras. I mean, not no one listening to this unless they have some kind of technology that allows for super extended life. No one listening to this will be alive in their current incarnation in the next Dwarpa Yuga, the next age, because at the end of Kali Yuga, there's still a 300 year crossover. Right. Each second past the last moment of Kali Yuga is going to be an improvement, a, a market improvement. And in fact, you know, people who are listening, assuming that they get through this <laughs> bottleneck rough, rough period of time that's coming up, uh, they will see certain things change dramatically very, during their lifetime. And in fact, in very short order, by 2030, things will be completely different than they are now completely different and it'll be pretty obvious by then that malachianism is in the rear view mirror and we're on the super highway towards luciferianism a lot of that will be very clear that said some of the rules like ma the way magic is going to change according to the angels we won't really see those effects during our lifetime other than that angelic magic is getting more and more powerful and lower astral demonic magic is weakening even now it's still very strong but the minute like if the second hand ticks past call you gets done it's going to drop off like a waterfall there'll be an immediate like at least 25 or 33 percent drop in the efficacy of demonic magic and a likewise spike in angelic magic will become more powerful just in this as an example so not sure why i said that something you said made me uh think about the way magic that's really worked. cool I, no i like the um, way you put that that was awesome yeah uh <laughs> so yeah, so I guess um, one of the things I want to share, and unfortunately, I do need to uh, get going here fairly soon. Um, sure. Gosh, there's lots, there's lots I want to share because you. We'll have to do a part two, oh, man. Maybe. Oh yeah, we can definitely. I, I'm definitely down for that, man. Um, yeah, so I guess what I want to leave people with is that things are going to change very rapidly in a very positive way. And, and it's actually well underway. You have to kind of look beneath the surface. I remember what you said. You said, do the Malachians know that they're going to lose or whatever? So kind of, I mean, I, what I'm saying is like, they're allowing the Luciferians to work under them. And there's this subversion that is either Malachian or Luciferian. That's still very prominent and, you know, programming and, all this stuff it's i was just hinting at like a lot of these uh elements cross over too and it's wondering if it's a hegelian dialectic and it's like i'm not i'm not saying there is no luciferian and malachian but is it the same hive mind controlling this dialectic you know no no no, no. it's okay. two very it, it, it's two very distinct energies and, and and most of the time when i say people are like luciferian or malachian mm -hmm. um I don't know whether they necessarily directly worship those deities. I will say the people at the pinnacles of power in both of those factions do 100% okay. without okay. question. Okay. That I don't um, doubt either. <laughs> most people, the Malachians keep that much more tightly under wraps than the Luciferians, because again, the Malachians want to push material stagnation and uh dead materialism on the masses in part because then they get to keep those goodies for themselves of black magic and so forth right right, right. okay yeah so they, they keep that very tight among themselves 
the Luciferians are forever trying to spiritualize and spread knowledge and all this explosion the past 60 years of esoteric knowledge. That's Luciferian like all oh, day. I mean, you're right. You're right. Massive. And it's both intentional and it's also just a functioning of this moving into the new era that we're moving in. It, it's both. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like there's natural laws naturally unfolding, but there's also people who are taking an active role. So the people who are at the tippy top of the Malachians, they don't, I, I literally think that they're convinced that they're going to win. Okay. They believe falsely. They've also been, I've been told by the angels again, so take out the grain of salt. Um, I've been told they've been being fed false prophecy for a long, long, long time. Probably by the Luciferians, if I had to make a guess. They've been given the false prophecy. And so things like 2030 and Agenda 2030, right? Right. It's correct that a new era will begin starting in 2030. What they're wrong about is it ain't going to be them in charge. Right. Okay. <laughs> the Great Reset, which is an economic and political thing, is actually an as above, so below thing of another functioning of what's happening right now. Apparently, again, Gnosis here from the angels, apparently at the end of Kali Yuga, the ascending Kali Yuga is weirdly like that's the end of it's not really intuitive, like it doesn't sort of make sense in a certain way, but that's the end of like kind of like that particular iteration of the cycle around the galactic center. We're coming up on a reset, actually in the next 70 years, um, the galactic center will be uh, zero degrees conjunct Capricorn on December 21st by uh, tropical reckoning. And that mo moment marks the beginning of the new cycle. Wow. The, the, and That's so cool. these next 70 years are in a way of like sort of like a playing out and a finishing up of the Kali Yuga. It, the Kali Yuga ends definitively. I just want to say that it ends definitively in, in 2025. But, you know, like there's 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 a period of time where things are going to unravel. And part of that is, is that there's this karmic reset. It's the greatest reset. And so all the world's karmas that we have accrued since the fall in consciousness that began at the really the falling of the the golden ages all that karma that's been built up it that has to be balanced out that ledger has to be balanced out so things like people who have demonic packs from prior lives are suddenly having demons in their ears saying hey pay up uh there's all the debt that's financial in nature there's this phenomenon of a lot of people are suddenly meeting their soulmate or they're walking down the street and they look at a guy and the guy looks at them and they're like, hey, fuck you. And they just get in a fight because th their souls have this negative karma they want to work out. And so they come together and then or, or someone just hates you for no reason. Like there's extreme reactions that people are having to other people all over the place. Oh, yeah. And it's because all these karmas are coming up and they're wanting to get unraveled. They're mm -hmm. wanting to get reset. They're going to be reset one way or the other. But um, it's best. I've been told it's it's best if you can work that out within yourself uh, in order to prepare prepare your soul and yourself for a the bottleneck event thing that's coming up and b what lies beyond that sort of setting right. yourself up for that. This is kind of like um, people talking about healing generational curses or generational healing in general. It's really yeah, that's, shrugging that's, off that's, this old old patterns. That's, big part of it yeah because we're, we're about to enter a new evolutionary cycle and there's something about i don't know why it works this way it's just what they've told me but there's something about like you're, you're going upwards you're growing and then and like just getting better and better and then like you just have this this fall in consciousness mm. that we've experienced since since the fall of atlantis and you know then it um it culminates during the kali yugas and the kali yugas is where we get most all of our karma it's probably 85% of the total of what we get because this is unfortunately the era of time where we, where we're, where, where it's fuck around and find out, you yeah, know, it's terrible. Yeah. It's reaction. It's, it's trauma. It's trauma reaction yes. over and over Absolutely. and over again. Yeah, Absolutely. And so um, <clears throat> oh, we're, we're working through these karmas. And so, um, you know, that's another example of where these Malachians kind of like they're misunderstanding stuff that's been given to them. And they think mm -hmm. that they're going to do a great reset that resets the debt, but then traps and freezes everyone. That's what they want to do. But the people who are like the, the true believers, who are the controllers at the top, you know, the black nobility and their buddies, right? Their yeah, little minions. Yeah. 
I believe that, that that layer is so insulated from reality that they don't see it coming. They do not see that the boom is about to swing around on the on the ship and just knock them right the fuck off the boat into sharks. They just do not see it. And part of that is, is the Luciferians are setting them up because there's a, a guarantee there's some Luciferian in Klaus Schwab's ear saying, tell them to eat the bugs next, Klaus. <laughs> yeah, put it's, a that, chip in their brain. It's, it's that Harari guy. <laughs> uh, that guy's got to be Malachian, but yeah, I see what you're saying. You think like, so? Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. A deep cover Luciferian. I mean, I did have that thought when you said that, but certainly everything that he says is Malachian as fuck. Yeah, fair enough. It's not yeah. Luciferian. Just the is digital he version. himself a Luciferian <laughs> that's a deep cover operative that's tricking them? Oh my God. It could Holy be. Shit. It could be. That's really interesting. I really need to sit with that one and think about it. That's really brilliant. Like, that's a great insight. It, it floated in my head right before you said it. I thought <laughs> nice. it, and I dismissed it immediately because he's such a scumbag and I hate him. He so is much. such a scumbag. And I kind of, yeah. I have some sympathy for uh, Luciferians uh, in the sense of I sure like him better than the Mockins. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Real quick, I should say um so, so anyways yeah eat tell hey klaus tell him to eat the bubs really try and really thicken that german master race accent before you got on stage hey right, why don't yeah. you put on this crazy fucking robe bro <laughs> and tell, absolutely tell man be i've been thinking about it from a different team. angle i've been thinking about this from a, oh sorry go ahead go ahead i was i've been thinking about this exact same thing from a different angle but yeah the, that it's like we've all been saying how obvious it is but it's like, yeah, think about that. It's it's not obvious, so it's weird and mysterious. It's obvious. It's too fucking obvious, you know. Yeah, and 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 you know, um, and I'll come on again, but just real sure. quick, um, the the Luciferians are about to turn the corner on them. I believe that they're going to use one of three things, or and they're not mutually exclusive. That will be when they take over. They control the ultra tech, so they control all the Uf the so called UFO tech. I do believe, just for what it's worth, I do believe that there that maybe one percent of the time when people see something in the sky and it's credible, it's not just that they are seeing delusions, right? Because I was going to say yeah. it's not like they're tripping on acid, but sometimes if you're tripping on acid, you can maybe so... see cloaked, cloaked vehicles. So that's maybe not a good way of saying it. But it, you know, <laughs> when people aren't seeing delusions or some trick of the light or swamp gas or whatever, right? <laughs> Those are all yeah. bullshit. But when people are seeing something something legitimate i believe that at least 90 percent of the time and i tend to think 99 percent of the time it's humans yeah. in ultra high tech That's that awesome. has been recovered um from atlantis the empire of rama reverse engineered uh, i have walter bosley on my show you would be really interested in it if you're on yeah. that tip walter bosley former fbi counterintelligence guy he's super into the ufo thing he says that um, he believes that during the Fourth Crusade, the Teutonic Knights brought back schematics that eventually passed to the Society of the Lizard, that eventually then went to uh, the Thula Society, and some of it was fed into the Nazis. And then when the Nazis were defeated, air quotes, and they had created De Glocka, the bell, that bell technology came to the U.S., then the question is, is where I'm not too sure and I'm open to either one is, did something crash at Roswell? Were aliens attracted because suddenly we were setting off nukes, radio waves, and radar, and so something could be seen off our planet for the first time in thousands of years? Yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe. It could also be that the Roswell crash was Nazis, right? Like, that's right. another one. That's the Joseph Farrell theory. And I, I, I'm not sure what I think about Roswell, and it kind of doesn't matter. The point is, is that regardless of where the technology originated, and I believe at least some of it originates from humans. Yeah. Probably the bulk. And then maybe a smaller amount is they found a ship in a cavern, right? Or they found something at the bottom of the ocean or the Baltic Sea. Right. <laughs> or wherever, right? And they <laughs> recovered a craft or Roswell or whatever other uh, craft thing where it is actually interdimensional or, or ex and or extraterrestrial craft that have a physical component that we could then reverse engineer. Anyway, you slice it. I believe that the vast majority of sightings are humans that are flying around in that. So that technology is controlled by the Luciferians. Yeah. The so-called totally quantum agree. financial system, which is actually more accurately the blockchain financial system that's being about to be rolled out, that is also controlled by the Luciferians. 
Because the Malakians are lucky if they can bang two rocks together and make a noise. They're fucking morons. But didn't they, dumb. So are we to, I'm, I know you have to go. I'm so sorry. Uh-huh. Just real quick. The secret societies throughout time that had the Gnosis, are they the dumb ones banging rocks together too? Or were they always the Luciferians out of the Malakians? Well, they're Luciferian or most high. I mean, there's the, 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 that's Okay. All right. Fair, 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 fair. People, gotcha. people, People want to just write off that there's no most high faction at all. The problem is, is that during the Kali Yuga, the Malachians can and will hammer down and kill immediately most high faction whenever they find it. Because they smell it a mile away and they hate it and they'll crucify you literally. Mm. Just ask Yeshua, right? Right. They hate it with every fiber of their being, whether it's the Cathars getting wiped out by the Vatican, right? Or whatever. Or indigenous people in the New World running into the Spaniards like... That's mm-hmm. Moloch versus Most High, and right now Moloch is a hammer and the Most High is a nail. That's going to change, but they have a karmic right to genocide. I was going to say this earlier, and I forgot. The Luciferians have a karmic right to wipe out the Malachians. Interesting. Then they can, yeah. and they will. But they do not have a karmic right to genocide on Most High people. What they can do is manipulate, subvert, and corrupt and they will. And that's going to be what the next 6,000 years is about for those of us who at least aspire to move in that most high direction. Yeah. If you look at that graphic from earlier, I my resting state is in that part of the Venn diagram, that triple Venn diagram, that's between the higher octave of Luciferianism and the lower octave of the the most high and when i'm in a really beautiful space i spike up into just pure most high consciousness and if someone cuts me off in traffic i might spike real low down to that lower end of luciferian you're either with me or against me conquest (laughs) it's competition it's ruthlessness comes pouring out of me and i'm like god damn or heaven forbid i lose at a magic card game that really (laughs) sends i get right off the rails if i lose in some bullshit way when i'm playing magic online um but so and that's something else people should recognize is if you go wow i like some of those luciferian traits hey so do i right right now people are like a lot of people are like oh man let's go right to the golden age baby the golden age is next and for what is worth angel said there's like a three percent or less chance that that could happen but it would require the bulk of humanity to be at a level of spiritual attainment that exceeds mine or some significant percentage of humanity so it ain't gonna happen right very low chance yeah right and, and ask yourself you know, a lot of people listening to this are like, I'm aligned with the most high, or at least I aspire to it. Okay, so imagine if you own a car or house, your buddy comes and says, I need this vehicle. I need your $60,000 truck. And 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 if you were in most high consciousness, you'd have perfect trust and you'd say, oh, yes, brother. And when and if you ever desire to bring that back unto me, then it shall become mine temporarily until the next one went- I ain't doing that, bro. Someone comes to my house talking about that. I'm going to be like, you know, Lucifer has a point with this contract based property rights thing. You know, <laughs> now that you mentioned we're not ready for gold. No. And I say that often too. The, the, we're just not ready. We're, we we're can ready. get there, but, but that, doesn't, that doesn't mean we should aspire to it. People like people always want to, you know, that one meme where there's that guy with very long legs and he's stepping over like seven stairs <laughs> to get to like a new stair. And it's always like, enlightenment and then like where i'm currently at and then the steps he's skipping over is like facing my shadow healing right. my trauma dealing with my parental wounds da, da. and he's stepping past all of that straight to enlightenment that's what everyone wants to do nobody wants to take the time to do the inner work right we, have to. we all have to do that but really what the next six thousand years where lucifer rules uh is going to be about is staying true to our principles when incredible material things are offered to us and incredibly brilliant intellectual arguments are about, well, should you really be for other people? Isn't really a selfish, enlightened self-interest? Isn't that really actually better? And let me give you, and they'll have some super elaborate explanation for it that, well, if you approach it from a mental space, you might go, wow, those Luciferians have a really good point. Because you have to transcend that and you have to play, come from a place of heart wisdom and stay right. true to your principles even if someone offers you the world, you know, wealth and riches and whatever, they're going to try and corrupt people and move them away. The vast bulk of humanity, when the Luciferians, either during the fake alien invasion, 
when they switch over the financial system or if they're dumb enough to shut off the internet globally for any length of time, if any of those three things happen or when they happen, that's in my opinion, when the Luciferians will make their move, because if the internet's down, that's fog of war, they can kill everyone. And then when it comes back up, when you do a coup, the first thing you take over is not the military. It's not the weapons. It's not the banks. Communication. Bingo. It's the media. It's the first thing you got to seize. You got to shut it down. Then you kill the president. You replace him with Gavin Newsom, right? Your, your fucking puppet piece of shit, trash, garbage human being. Fuck that motherfucker if he runs for president. I'll just say that now. I want to be the first <laughs> to say fuck Gavin Newsom in 2024. Hell yeah. And fuck that guy. Anyways, like if they replace the, the, the president with their puppet. And then they turn on the media and they go, oh, well... Funny thing happened, like the bad guys got defeated and we're the good guys. And that's yeah. exactly what they're going to do. They're going to, if the Malakians shut down the internet as part of their great reset thing and they think they're going to be rounding up regular people, oh no. That's yeah. when the Luciferian strike forces will grab them. And then when it all comes back up again, they'll go, crazy shit happened, bro. We got the pedophiles. We got the bankers who've been using usury for forever. We got the people, except for the people who designed it. We got the people yeah. who did the recent pandemic. Pay no attention to the technical scientists that were involved and the engineers and brilliant people who thought of it. That they had nothing to do with it. It was just these damn Malachian motherfuckers. And shouldn't we hang them by the neck? And everyone's going to cheer. I'm going to cheer. Yes, you're see, right. And, and, and you know, just to caveat this. To get hung, I'm going to. You know, go ahead, have your kangaroo court fake Nuremberg 2.0. That's a foregone conclusion. That's just a little garnish to make it sound good. I don't give a shit. The sooner that these Malachians are hanging from a gibbet someplace, the better for humanity and the better for them because they can reincarnate and maybe not be under that mind. <laughs> maybe. <control>. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I uh, see beautiful, wonderful things happening in the not too distant future in that there will be a huge, huge opening for wonderful things to happen in the world that simply cannot happen now under the current circumstances. Right. And, you know, it's 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 a false light that's coming. It's a false light. And let me be clear about that. And I, I have zero plans to worship Lucifer. It's not going to happen. And that will be asked of people. That will be rolled out very quickly. Like, look who saved you. It's, it's everywhere. The it's the Luciferians who saved you, right? Right. And so, like, maybe you should worship Lucifer, and, and we certainly should run things, don't you agree? And by the way, you know, we have all this thing. And so certain things that are being rolled out now, we're going to stick, in my opinion. Digital ID is almost certainly going to stick. Yeah. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because what of consequence can you do right now in the United States other than voting without a photo ID? Nothing. And it's been that way for a long time, and the world's becoming digital now. Now, am I, am I naive to the fact that digital ID could create a dystopian hellscape, the likes of which we've never seen, attached to social credit, all that stuff? Yes, I'm fucking painfully aware of that. What I'm saying is, is that they're going to say, oh, the Malakians wanted to use it for pure evil, but we're just going to give it because you need it now to do your uh, Bitcoin exchange or whatever with the new system. Sorry, we just have to insist. Oh, and... Yeah, well, we need the surveillance state because you never know when the Malakians might come back. So we're just going to keep that, too, and, and intensify it and increase it. They're going to keep subtle control. Because right. anyone with two fucking brain cells knows that this brittle-ass system of the Great Reset it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. It's already not working. It's no, already, it's already making a fraud. Arms and piss. And the Luciferians are in the Malakians' ears. You know what your problem is, Klaus Schwab? You haven't gone far enough. It's right, not enough yeah. to mutilate children's genitals. It's not enough to threaten them with eating bugs. It's not enough to say you're going to stick them in a pot and a brain chip. You need to say even more, Klaus. And these Malakians are dumb as fuck. They're just, they can't think of anything other than their desire to consume innocence and destroy. It's all they want. Mm. And so they're like, the Luciferians were the ones who were holding them back and saying, oh, brush them off stage quickly. The Klaus Schwab didn't mean that. That's the way it would have been 30 years ago. They right. would rush out and right. do our spin. And now, instead, they're in his ear going, yeah, Klaus, keep it up. Just say whatever your darkest, the most insane fantasies are in live footage. It sounds like it's Jordan Peterson in his ear. 
and it probably is with his well, fucking Jordan Peterson's pretty Luciferian in my dude. He's he's you know forming an international consortium to fight the WEF. So it's like it's right on its face. It's and that's kind of where I've been talking about. It. It's like oh shit, are we going back to an exoteric rule? Because like yeah, the WEF, the the all that shit ain't gonna be our future. And what I was worried about was it was going the opposite direction where it was going to be like, yeah, everything's going to collapse because we're not going to accept any of this. And that's going to be the real house of cards that just collapses. And then we go to Mad Max and it goes way backwards in time to that exoteric you know, rule. The Luciferians don't want that. And that's part of it. See, there's a grain of truth. And I really have to go, brother. There is. Yeah, I'm so sorry to keep you like this. <laughs> This whole 17th letter of the alphabet thing. Ah, yeah. It's a multi-layered thing. The Malachians were using it to flush out patriots. The Luciferians were using it to lay the groundwork of a narrative of white hats when really they're gray hats, mm. right? Yeah, 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 I like gray that. Hats. yeah, I like and that. And they are, uh, some amount of that stuff that's said by those people has grains of truth to it. Like, I really wonder about like, what is this weird thing with Biden and green screens and whatever? Like that seems legitimately real. Like I've just seen enough of it. I think it's true. And then I was like, Oh, well, if you were trying to trick the Chinese Malachians into thinking that they had control and you were just like trying to get people to come out, you might let them think that they had their guy in and let him push through his most ruthless, horrible things. Meanwhile, you actually had control. Interesting. The thing is, is that the Moloch, apparently every time we get to this stage of the Kali Yuga, his hands are with a white knuckle grip on the steering wheel. And he says, oh, well, if, if someone else wants to drive, we're going right off this fucking cliff, bro. We're, I'm killing all of y'all. Yeah. Because Moloch has two things. Total submission to the point where you give him your children, the fear that passeth understanding, opposite of the peace that passes understanding of the Most High. The fear that passes understanding where you sacrifice your own children to him. Or total annihilation. That's it. There's no other compromise. You're either with us or you're against us, right? Absolutely. It's right back to that. And so if the Malachians did indeed realize that they were going to lose control and they felt truly threatened, they'd go and nuke the entire planet. They'd oh say, God. great, we have no problem with annihilating everything. So Is that what Putin's doing? <laughs> very careful. The Luciferians have to be very careful in the way in which they take over. Right. And and I mean, this has probably been at least decades in the planning. At oh, least yeah. decades. Well, I got some and, links for you. Maybe <laughs> centuries. It could even have been centuries of examining what they did. And also keep in mind, the Luciferians created the modern world. The Machians yes. didn't. They're dumb as fuck. I don't know how to emphasize it enough. They're really, really dumb. They're extremely mm. powerful. And right now on a spiritual level, they have total dominance. But... It, we're now in a window to where things can start to move towards this Luciferian impulse. And so if you're trying to do a global coup d'etat against a deeply entrenched 6,000 year old death cult, and you're not exactly nice guys yourself, you're going to trick regular people into thinking you're nice, white hats, and you're going to very subtly move things into position, and you're going to have to do it almost overnight. I don't think it'll be that fast, but I bet you that when the proverbial shit hits the fan... I don't think it'll take more than two years before it's just completely over. It probably won't even take that long. Mm. I think that the 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 nerve centers of Malachians will be taken out like possibly within a week's time. That supposed 10 days of darkness, that sounds about right. If you have something that can go 30,000 miles per hour that has phase plasma weapons in the 40 watt range to grow <laughs> Terminator, Holy right? Shit. Yeah, and and and, and you, the Malakins are dumb enough to let them position these all over the planet for for a fake alien invasion, and then when they go fake alien invasion and they shut off the internet, maybe or or just fake alien invasion, you can take your ship and fly right to the Rothschild Chateau and go, blah, 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 <laughs> or go down there with stormtroopers and just take over, take out all their security and. You know, some of them they'll probably kill immediately because they're too dangerous, but they'll have plenty of them that are going to get drug out in front of the cameras for right. The yeah, absolutely. And so if you look, they're laying a narrative. Like every week, there's more. Like the Epstein story, it just won't fucking go away. No, no, it just getting thirty more years juicy. ago. That shit would happen. Boys Town, H. W. Bush. There's a documentary, right? I forget what it's called. A uh, conspiracy of silence or something like that. I forget what that, that Boys Town. Oh, I yeah, I think you, it's something like that. Yeah. 
I think it's called Conspiracy of Sounds. I can't remember, but if you look up pedophile, the boys town, H.W. Uh, Bush, like th- there was a complete documentary came out that blew wide open the pedophile blackmail networks circa 1990 or 1991. And that shit got erased, deleted. It was even in TV guides that it was going to come out. It got deleted, erased. George H.W. Bush, the, the unauthorized biography, disappeared. They used to have way more control. And all of a sudden, things just won't go away. Right, yeah. And it's not because of the good people on the ground are working hard. Very powerful forces are keeping that narrative running. Oh, absolutely. I mean, How does that make any sense if you're part of that blackmail network? You'd want to get rid of it right away. No, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. I like Last- that. Last thought, and then I'll go, is just that I can tell your listeners without going into any detail, I have been very privileged and fortunate, and by the grace of the Most High, that I have recently uh, rubbed shoulders with people who at one point in time were moving trillions of dollars of money around. And they are good people. Um, Some of them have been more recently spiritually awakened as in they were sort of God's, the most high sleeper cells. They were people (laughs) in very high positions of power. Some of them even were atheists, but then they had a spiritual awakening and that they're, I can't go into too much detail. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be a tease, but this is very real. I assure you. Um, I mean, (laughs) I guess you just have to take me some random guy on the internet's word for it, but I will tell you sincerely, there are beautiful projects underway with, deep capital, very intelligent, very powerful people at, at high levels. And I'm not talking Luciferian. I'm talking about something else entirely. There's, there's other forces at work in the world than the will of evil, Frodo, as Gandalf said. <laughs> and, and, Absolutely. And, and I can say that I have firsthand experience with that. And and I've vetted these people. They're exactly who they say they are. Their LinkedIn is exactly the say they are. You know, like I, I know that they are who they say they are. I've, I've met some of them. I've met in person even, mm-hmm. and there's really good stuff afoot. And That's things things are things are changing. And so the nice thing is, is during this war between the Malakians and the Luciferians, and plus the eventual overthrow of the Malakians, there's going to be breathing room for the first time in six thousand years for those of us who aspire towards the Most High. Wow, that was a great way to. That's a great yeah, place yeah. to leave it. Absolutely, you... and we're gonna have to do a part two. My God, I have to go to bed. <laughs> I'm so sorry I had to keep you this long, but oh, I think okay. it was necessary. This is a great conversation, man. And please, before you go, tell the listeners where to find you. Yeah, yeah. So you can find me on uh, whitelotusoflight.com. Um, I am uh, actually I have an angelic. If you get this up in time, I have an angelic magic class that starts. Um, July 6th, I have one for people in Oceania, Asia, Australia, and then I have another one uh, in the U.S. If that one fills, I may be opening one on the 13th, so I'm doing angelic magic classes. You can find that on whitelotusoflight.com under consultations. Uh, At the bottom, you can register for that. And then um, I am very soon, because I'm about to start some consulting work, I'll just leave it at that. that involves astrology. I'm going to be shutting down um, doing natal charts and Navamsa charts and so forth for uh, for the public for the foreseeable future. So if you're interested in Vedic astrology, which is looking at your soul's karmas, and there's a natal chart for first 40 years, there's a Navamsa chart for post 40, different karmas ripen post 40. If you're interested in either of those, I am shutting that down on July 21st. So uh, yeah, and then you can find me White Lotus of Light on YouTube, and you can find all my crazy rants and rambling and uh, talking to invisible friends. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, man. Well, it's been a yeah. real pleasure. I uh, really enjoyed you, learning from you and and getting to talk to you about all these different things. And, and yeah, you, we could cover many me, more grounds. You got me turned on to a bunch of stuff in this conversation, brother. It was Great. definitely a two-way thing. I'd like want to look into the pixies thing. There's a bunch of stuff you said made me think about the rule, rule of might and the rule of the sword and the exoteric, esoteric, brilliant. I'm glad and we could do that. A lot of good stuff. I'm going to need some time to digest myself. So. Cool, man. Yeah, we'll have some links for each other, I'm sure, <laughs> to, to share and, uh, and have more conversations in the future. So everybody, please go check out Ian's work. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening and watching, and see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Deep 
Share Podcast. If you want to hear more, then hit that subscribe button. Follow me on all the social places. And remember, think for yourself, but don't always believe what you think. Till next time. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, cactus carrier. Enough, I get the point. <laughs> you meddle with the primal forces of nature. <laughs> and you will atone. What do we know? What do we know? If I know what we know, then I can tell you what we know, and if someone else knows, okay? Ha 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 ha!